So now that we have seen how tasks can be created, let's look at a little bit more detail on how tasks get scheduled for execution. So the first thing is, you know, we want to understand this concept of multitasking a little better. Multitasking is basically the ability to simulate the fact that multiple tasks can run simultaneously, right? And the reason I'm sort of emphasizing this word simulate over here is because in reality, I may not have multiple physical processor cores at all in my system. I could entirely be running on a single processor core, but the processor typically runs at at least megahertz speeds. And nowadays, very common to have things in the hundreds of megahertz or possibly even gigahertz, even embedded, small embedded processors, right? So when we have such a thing, when a processor is working on a nanosecond time scale, fooling a human being who cannot even sort of sense things less than tens or possibly even hundreds of milliseconds time scales means that between every, you know, uh, sort of reaction that the human can have, you could have millions of clock cycles being processed by the actual computer, which means that it could potentially do many different tasks by switching between them fast enough that the human being doesn't even know that such a thing has happened in the background. Right? Now, there are two very important terms that come up in this context that are worth understanding. One is called concurrency. Concurrency basically refers to the ability to run multiple different program units in different orders, right? An example of that is shown on the right side over here with this diagram. Basically, what it says is this, what this picture is showing is that we have concurrent execution on a single core system, okay? We have two tasks, we call them task A and task B. And what we have is task A is executed for a certain amount of time. Then I stop, switch over and run task B for a certain amount of time. Then I switch and again run task A for a certain amount of time, finish it, right? So at this point in time, task A has completed and then switch back to task B and complete it by this point, which means that the, by this point in time, both task A and task B have completed for as long as this entire time duration was let's say in the order of a few milliseconds as far as the end user is concerned it looks as though they both happened at the same time right i can't tell the fact that they were actually broken up into segments like this to me both of them happened simultaneously okay now this concurrent execution even though i'm using the word simulated this is not exactly a simulation what i mean over here is that the appearance of simultaneity of two things happening at the same time is being simulated. But what is actually happening is two different programs are running, two tasks are running and are completing within a certain time budget that I have. Okay, So concurrency basically means that it is possible to run these in possibly different orders. It doesn't matter whether I run A first and then B first or B first and then A first or a part of A then a part of B, go back and finish some more of A, then come back and finish some more of B and so on, right? The order doesn't matter as long as I can complete both of them. If I have such a property that this kind of concurrency is acceptable, depending on the applications that I have, then it is possible for me to slice time up and basically do both of them in such a way that both seem to be running in parallel with each other, even though there is only one single processor core. Now, this may not always be possible. There may be scenarios where I actually have dependencies. I have task A, which may actually require reading some data from a network uh, interface, right? Actually performing a web request and getting some data. And task B, which is actually saving that data into a file. Until I have actually got the data from the network, I can't do anything with the data. I can't process it. I can't actually do anything uh, except, okay, uh, no, let's not consider the example of saving to a file. Let's say that I need to uh, perform some computation that involves all the data that is present in the file, like let's say sorting the data, right? I cannot actually do that until all the data has now been received, right? So if I need to do something of that sort, then I clearly have a dependency. Task A must be completed before I can get to task B. If that is the case, then concur they are not concurrent. Uh, tasks, right? I cannot execute task A and task B by slicing them up like this and sort of giving the illusion that they are both running at the same time. 
Now, parallelism takes the idea of concurrency. In other words, it requires concurrency between operations and then says, if I have two physical processors, right, I can actually run task A and task B at exactly the same time, overlapping in time. Right? So, this, if I take any instant of time, right, I will actually find that there is some part of task A, some instruction of task A and some instruction of task B running on the two different processors that are physically available to me. So, parallelism is sort of building on top of concurrency. It is saying that, yes, I have concurrency in my system and now I have two different processors. Instead of trying to, you know, fool the user into thinking that they are happening at the same time, why not actually run them together at the same time? Okay. So, concurrency in some sense is more important from the point of view of the operating system. You need to know what tasks can be run concurrently. Parallelism is something that is required for performance. It gives you the ability to do more within a given amount of time. Unless you have concurrency, having parallelism is useless. You cannot run two tasks in parallel unless they have the property of concurrency to start with. So now, we get to the problem of we have concurrent tasks, how do I schedule them? Okay. And the example that we looked at was basically, you know, once again, we have these two tasks out here. Uh, given the fact that they are basically going to sleep, right, this task delay has been called over here, I can think of them as concurrent tasks, right. Uh, the task sort of starts, does some work and then basically says, okay, now I don't have anything to do, just go to sleep for a little while, okay. So, I can think of these as being concurrent tasks. They are both sort of started out at the beginning. I do not wait for task 1 to complete. In fact, there is no notion of completion of this task, right? The task never ends. So, if I say, oh, I'm, I have to wait for task 1 to complete before I start task 2, that's it. I am stuck over here. I will never get beyond task 1 and never even start on task 2. But the point is, because of the way that these tasks have been created and the way that they behave, they can actually operate concurrently, which is why when you run this, you actually see the messages task 1, task 2 in an interleaved manner. Okay. So, the task creation sets up two tasks and registers them with the scheduler. The individual tasks then call the delay functionality, which basically gives back control to the scheduler to allow other tasks to run. Right. Now, the scheduler, what exactly is it doing? The scheduler's job, the scheduler after all is yet another function. Right. And if you think about it, what is happening is task create, task create. So, task 1 starts, it does something. At this point in time, it is going to jump into some part of the scheduler code itself. right? And in that scheduler code, what the scheduler is going to do is, it will have some kind of a list of tasks that basically say, okay, which ones are ready to run? Which one? And ready to run means that, you know, their timer has basically expired. So, they are you know, okay, I waited for enough time. Now, the next time that you are free, please let me run is basically what the task is saying, right? If there is a task that is ready to run, it's going to go ahead and run that task, either task 1 or task 2. If both are ready, it will do them in some priority. In this case, both have the same priority. That's fine. It will just pick them in whichever order and run them, right? And once both have run and both have gone to sleep, we come back into the scheduler. Now it sees there's nothing ready to run. The scheduler also waits. It just sits there waiting for something to become ready. Okay. So that is the job of the scheduler. Literally all the time it is going and looking at some kind of a list of tasks that are currently ready to run. If there is something ready over there, it gives control to that task, waits for it to return control. Okay. So the scheduler is also a piece of code, a function, just like any other function that we write but which has very specific behaviors in terms of how it can jump right into the middle of a task, which is some other function that has been executed partially so far. Okay. Timers are a very important part of this entire system, right? It's one of the most common types of task or actually more importantly, it's a type of event that is used in order to schedule tasks, right? Uh, in particular, you could have something which is a periodic task. The examples that we saw earlier were automatically scheduled. Those are periodic tasks where after 1000 milliseconds or after 500 milliseconds, the task basically says, okay, schedule me again. Right? Now, we could do that in a slightly different manner where we basically say that you could have something called a timer callback. Right? And the way that that would work is 
we basically create a timer and this would actually make use of the hardware timer peripherals that are present in most microcontrollers right remember that timer peripherals are sort of things that run independent of the cpu right the cpu doesn't need to actually count or add one to a counter there is actually physical hardware that's taking care of the counting behind the scenes so this function timer create is actually able to set up or once again by going through the hardware abstraction layer and the device driver will finally be able to set up one of the hardware timers that I have in my system in order to basically wake me up after a certain interval. It's not visible on the screen, but it will probably be, let's say, you know, few tens or hundreds of milliseconds, right? And what this says is that, you know, as long as I was able to create such a timer, start the timer. And basically, every time that the timer sort of expires, this function, the timer callback is automatically invoked. And in this case, what would happen is every time that this duration expires, it would print out timer triggered, timer triggered and so on. Right? Uh, I'm not showing an example of this actually running, but you can actually write code like this and test it out. Okay? Once again, what happens is there is a task scheduler still there. What the task scheduler does is it now sees the timer itself as a task that needs to get executed repeatedly and therefore it ensures that you know uh, the functionality is already provided out there. Right. And uh, the timer in turn could be used to trigger other kinds of tasks as well. Right. The timer could in general even be considered as an interrupt. It could be used in order to generate an interrupt. And as we will see later, interrupts in turn can trigger the execution of certain tasks. So this figure is a sort of busy figure which shows you what the internals of a scheduler typically look like right uh, the scheduler task right the function of the scheduler it maintains some data structures inside it which are basically some things called queues right a queue is something that we'll be looking at more later in a different context but for all practical purposes you understand it, you probably have a intuitive understanding of what a queue is as and when tasks become ready they sort of come and stand one by one behind each other in a queue and what the scheduler does is it basically picks up a task from the queue and runs it right so as you can see there are typically different queues with different priorities over here right or you could have a single queue but it's called a priority based queue which means that the highest priority task automatically comes to the front of the queue right Either way, what the scheduler needs to do is typically in a scenario like this where you have multiple queues, what it would do is it would first check the high priority queue. If there is anything on the high priority queue, it will take out one task from that, run it on the CPU. Once this has completed or has given control back, it would go pick up the next task and run that. Only when the high priority queue becomes empty, does it go to the medium priority queue and start running tasks over there. And only when this becomes empty and this is also empty does the low priority queue get to run right now whether you actually explicitly have three different queues or you have a single queue with where high priority items automatically come to the front right which can also be implemented quite efficiently as a data structure right both are different ways of approaching the same problem so this is the job of the scheduler it just basically needs to manage this queue pick out the highest priority item that is currently ready and execute it. Now that word ready is actually important over here. There may be a lot of tasks in the system. Many of them may be waiting. They may be waiting for a timer to expire or they may be waiting for some other kind of resource to become available, which means that the items that are sitting in the queue are only the ones that are actually ready to go onto the CPU if they get a chance. Right. So that's all the scheduler has to do. It has to first check whether the queues have something waiting and then go and switch over to them and actually run that task. It's entirely possible that sometimes there may be no tasks waiting to run. In which case, basically there is always something called an idle task whose job is just basically wait for a certain amount of time, right? And it's usually a, the lowest priority task, which means that any other task that comes along at any point can promptly interrupt the idle or preempt the idle task and take over instead of it. Now, there are several problems that come up in the context of scheduling, right? One of them is so-called deadlock. 
And this can happen, for example, if I have two tasks, one is waiting for input from A is waiting for some input from B and B in turn is waiting for some input from A. You have a scenario called deadlock. Both tasks are waiting for something from the other task and neither one is able to move forward. Okay. How can this happen? It's essentially a bug, right? It's a problem with the code. But these are bugs that are not easy to find. There can be scenarios that can be constructed that become fairly complicated and difficult for to even analyze and say, okay, is there actually a possibility of deadlock happening out here? Right? There is also another possibility called starvation. This especially happens for low priority tasks. Right? What happens in starvation is that you always have high priority tasks that are taking up the CPU and therefore a low priority task never gets to run at all. Right? There is so much other work happening that the low priority task simply never gets a chance to execute. This, If this ever happens, there could be multiple possibilities. One of them is that maybe your priority settings are wrong. Right? You should not be assigning such high priorities to so many other tasks. Or it could be that your high priority tasks have a problem because they are taking too long to execute. Or it could simply be a sign that the CPU you have chosen is not powerful enough for the system that you want to run. Right? It's not able to finish the high priority tasks fast enough to actually manage the low priority tasks. Now, finally, there is a very interesting concept called priority inversion, which I'm not getting into detail over here, but I would strongly recommend you read about it. There is a very nice anecdote about the Mars Pathfinder, uh, the spacecraft that was sent in 1997 uh, by NASA to Mars. And that had a problem where actually every now and then the system would just basically stop responding, right? And what was happening over there was that there was a low priority task that was blocking a high priority task because the low priority task had basically taken control of a resource. The high priority task came and preempted the low priority task, but the low priority task did not relinquish control of the resource, right? Now, it was actually a bit more complicated than that. What actually was happening was normally you could sort of get around that by saying that as soon as the high priority task comes, the low priority task should also relinquish control of the resource to the high priority task. In between, there was also a medium priority task that was actually interrupting the low priority task. So it's a somewhat complicated story, but on the other hand, very interesting in terms of the kind of things that can go wrong when you have when you are trying to assign priorities to tasks, right? So priority inversion is essentially a scenario where you have a high priority task and a low priority task, both depending on a shared resource. The high priority task gets to preempt the low priority task, but still gets blocked because it's waiting on the resource that has been locked by the low priority task. Now, this and you know various other kinds of problems with it are things that people have sort of identified as issues over time. There are recommended ways of avoiding such scenarios and of getting around these kind of problems. So especially when you get into real time programming with such systems, it's important to have a clear understanding of the issues that can happen because of priorities in tasks and how to deal with them.